awoken by the first light of dawn and the chirping of mountain birds. I listened to the rustling of chipmunks tidying up the remnants of my camp dinner. The pure joy I felt being in nature after so many years was short-lived as the realities of the day set in. At 6,000 feet, the air was crisp and refreshing. Stepping out of the tent, I was struck by the sight of an alpine lake encircled by snow-capped mountains. I yearned to push aside my worries, clear my mind, and go fishing. However, I knew today was the day I'd been dreading for the past month. Today was the day of confrontation, the day I needed to face head-on so I could begin anew. I cooked a simple breakfast of eggs and sausage on the propane stove, accompanied by thick black coffee. As I sat finishing my meal, preparing for a six-mile hike, I marveled at the tranquility of the moment. It was a reminder that life offers beauty and joy if we keep moving forward. I vowed to return to camping, hiking, fishing, and sailing, hobbies I had set aside for 23 years of marriage to the woman I once wholeheartedly considered the love of my life. I remained hopeful that love would find me again. The descent was smooth and uneventful. I didn't cross paths with anyone on the trail until I reached the car. I loaded my gear into the car and headed for the main road. After three days of being disconnected, I turned my phone back on, knowing I'd soon be within cell coverage and the barrage of texts and emails would commence. As I merged onto the two-lane county road, I heard the first notification. The message was from my 21-year-old son, Ryan. Our relationship had evolved from father and son to best friends and confidants. Dad, I love you and support you. Good luck today and stay positive. Someday, there will be a light at the end of this tunnel. His words brought tears to my eyes and fortified me for what lay ahead. The next message was from my daughter, Krista, offering a pledge of love and support. Dad, I wish I could be there with you, to hug you and assure you that everything will be okay. You've always been the best father, always putting us first. Now, it's your turn to prioritize yourself. Regardless of what happens, Ryan and I love you, and we're always here for you. Krista, a daddy's girl and the spitting image of my wife Linda in her youth, inherited my love for adventure, the outdoors and my quirky sense of humor, traits Linda didn't share. I was blessed with children I adored and respected, my greatest legacy. After a brief pause to review my messages, emails, voicemails, and missed calls, I noticed ten missed calls from my wife over the last three days. The initial seven were likely from her three-day banking seminar and supposed business trip to Vegas. The last three seemed to be from her return last night and again this morning. I could only imagine her fury when I failed to pick her up from the airport and didn't respond to her calls or texts. I didn't bother listening to the voicemails, opting instead to delete them all and move on to my inbox. As expected, Linda had sent me around 20 messages over the past three days. I didn't bother responding. The first few messages were declarations of her undying love for me, which I dismissed as guilt-driven nonsense. The latter ones were filled with resentment because I hadn't answered her calls and left her stranded at the airport for over an hour before she realized I wasn't showing up. Her last message was a simple DTF Jack, all in capitals. It was a stark reminder of how our relationship had deteriorated over the past months. I wondered if she even realized how my love for her, once a vibrant flame, had slowly dimmed. Had she truly become so distant over the last tumultuous four months? Had she stopped considering my feelings, my pain? Was she oblivious to the hurt in my eyes that I was sure she could see? Had she forgotten about our children, our family, and the love we once shared? The thought was more depressing than her messages. Linda, even at 44, was stunning. She had a perfect figure, slender legs, and knew how to present herself, whether at a social event or as a rising star in the banking industry. I took pride in being seen with her, relishing the envious glances from other men. Her protests about aging and losing her youthful energy always fell on deaf ears. I tried my best to reassure her that she was becoming more radiant, not less, but she brushed off my compliments, saying I was obligated to say such things as her husband. John Monroe, her boss, somehow became a new light in her life, at least sexually. I was relegated to the role of a reliable friend, though I felt even that bond had been severed. Linda, however, seemed oblivious to this change. Monroe, the wealthy vice president of the trust department, was tall, thin, and so self-assured I found him annoying. Linda, on the other hand, saw him as a great leader. 
The discussions about her work life and Monroe ceased abruptly four months ago. In retrospect, I believe that was when her affair began, marking the end of our 23 years together. Shaking off my depressive thoughts, I looked at my phone again, deleted all her messages with a growl of frustration, and moved on to other emails. My lawyer informed me that everything was set according to our agreement. I also noticed a message in a private chat. The man you were interested in got into serious trouble during a robbery. One crushed testicle and a shattered knee. Upon closing the chat, the message was automatically erased. The next email I reviewed confirmed that my resignation from my job had been accepted and my 401k and stock options had been liquidated with the proceeds transferred to my new checking account. The upcoming tax hit would be a tough pill to swallow, but I didn't mind. I needed to get away. Just as I was about to hit the road, my phone rang. It was Linda. I decided it was time to confront the situation, likening it to the swift removal of a bag. I pulled over, switched off the engine, and answered the call with as much detachment as I could muster. Hey, Linda. What's up? She demanded, her voice filled with confusion and anger. Where have you been? You weren't at the airport, you weren't home, and you haven't responded to my calls or messages for a week. What's going on, Jack? I replied, I thought you wouldn't mind whether I responded or not, Linda. It gives you time to clean up and get back into character before facing me. The kids are friends or your parents. Isn't that how your double life works? She seemed taken aback. What are you talking about, Jack? I don't understand this a double life you're referring to. And why aren't the kids answering my calls? And where is our king-size mattress from the master bedroom? I had to sleep in the guest room last night. What's happening? Jack, it feels like I'm in the twilight zone. You are in the twilight zone, Linda. One you've created for yourself and our family. I replied, feeling a sense of satisfaction as her aggressive tone faltered and her worst fears began to surface. What does that mean, Jack? Where are you? What's happening? She asked, her voice trembling. I'm out of town, Linda. I've been busy trying to figure out how to move on from the major betrayal in my life and start anew. She gasped at the word of betrayal but tried to maintain her composure. Jack, are you drunk? What are you talking about? I decided to confront her directly. How was your three-day banking conference, Linda? Did that John sleep with you every night and morning? Or just the three nights? There was silence on the other end, followed by a gasp. After a few seconds, she stammered. What are you talking about, Jack? I'm married to you. Yes, Linda, you are married to me. But it seems like you've forgotten what that means. Can you at least respect our 23 years of marriage and tell me the truth? I know you've been lying and deceiving me and our family for months. Now that it's all out in the open, can you be honest? Her voice was shaky when she replied, Jack, I don't know what you're imagining, but you're wrong. I only love you. There's nothing between me and John Monroe. Well, at least now you've admitted which John I'm talking about. I retorted, feeling a strange sense of satisfaction. Did you think you'd never get caught, Linda? Or did you just not care? Why didn't you tell me you wanted a divorce and loved someone else? It would have been easier for everyone if you'd been honest from the start. She shouted back, her voice choked with tears, Jack. Don't even mention the word divorce. I only love... Please come home so we can talk about this. Nothing happened, how could you think otherwise? Linda seemed to believe I had no evidence and was bluffing, so she continued her act. You're saying you never slept with Monroe in our bedroom, on our now absent king-size bed? No, of course not. What are you talking about, Jack? Hold on a minute, Linda. I pulled out one of the many photos and videos I had received from a camera hidden in our bedroom. It was a photo of Linda and John Monroe in a compromising position. I sent it to her and returned to the call. Linda, check the photo I just sent. Are you telling me that's not my wife cheating on me in our bedroom with her boss? I heard her gasp and break down. Oh God, no, Jack, please. It was a mistake. It only happened once. It didn't mean anything. It was just a fling, just the thrill of someone younger who desired me. It made me feel attractive and youthful again. It was the only time, and I never meant to hurt you. Oh God, I'm so sorry, Jack. Linda, look out the window. See that pile of charred wood, metal, and ash in the backyard. That's our time size mattress. That's a symbol of how you burned our marriage, betrayed our family, humiliated me. When did you start hating me enough to cause me such pain? When did you decide that my love, our children's love, meant nothing to you? 
When did you decide I wasn't worthy of respect and honesty? When and why did you decide to throw us away like garbage? Jack, please, please forgive me. I love you. I can never hate you. I want to spend my life with you. It was an accident, a terrible mistake, and it happened only once. It was my selfishness. Not your fault. Please, Jack, come home and talk to me. Linda, the children and I have had enough of lies and deception. Can you finally be honest with me? Is that why the kids aren't answering my calls, Jack? Did you tell them? Did you turn them against me? Linda, I haven't done anything to keep the kids away from you. You did that all by yourself with your friend. It's all on you. Your selfishness, your need for someone else's man, is what led you into this mess and destroyed our family. And no, it wasn't me who told the children. It was the children who told me. It's a shame you could lie and abandon us so easily. At least, stop lying now. This wasn't just one time. This has been going on for at least four months, judging by how you've emotionally cut us out of your life. The saddest part is you didn't even realize it. You stopped talking to us, stopped looking at me, stopped making love to me, except for the occasional pity sex. Jack, it was just sex, just one time, and just a lapse in judgment after 23 years of marriage. I want you not, John. Please believe me. Hold on, Linda. I pulled out another photo from my phone, the one where Ryan came home unexpectedly, heard his mother and Monroe, and took several pictures and videos. He didn't tell me for two weeks until he and Cresta decided I had a right to know. This was what prompted me to buy a spy camera. I also shared this photo with Linda. Linda, when you opened your phone, this was the first time any of us discovered your affair with your boss. The way you emotionally distanced yourself from me three months before this picture. I'm convinced you were lovers all along. Linda, it was Ryan who found out first, and he took a picture of you in bed together. What the hell? Can you imagine how your son feels after seeing his mother's betrayal? Don't you understand that it's put him off and you've lost his and Christ's respect? When they saw those pictures and had to decide whether to inform me about your adulterous behavior, do you think they have any trust or respect for you now? Do you know how hard it was for them to tell me that you were dishonest and how painful it was to hear them cry as they watched you wreck our marriage and shatter our family? Stop lying about it only happening once, about it not going on for months, and about not sleeping with him six or seven times on your recent business trip. I'll hang up on your next lie. No, Jack, please let me explain. Heard Linda sobbing, picturing her collapsing on the floor as she finally realized that her lies and betrayal had hurt her family and herself. Oh God, Jack, I'm so, so sorry. Please, you must forgive me. I went crazy, but it's over now. It was just cheap sex, and the thrill of being desired and involved in a secret affair made me feel young and desirable again. But there was no love, and I never wanted to hurt you. I don't know how I didn't see it. I didn't even realize how distant I was from you and the children, and I'm ashamed to admit that right now I wake up and see myself as some other person from a horror movie or nightmare, and I hate myself for it because I love you, the children, and our life together. Oh dear Jack, please, please come home so I can make things right. I need to make us a family again. Linda, there is no USA. We're done. You can't say you loved me after you cheated on me and caused me pain and emotional damage. You've shown that you have no respect for me, no care for anyone but yourself, and because of your lies and I will never trust you again. Everything we had before is now tainted and suspicious. Have you been cheating on me with him for the last few years or four months? How many other men have you been with? Do I need to have my children's DNA tested? Don't bother answering because I won't believe a word you say. Of course, need to get tested for steez. You and I have nothing left. You've hurt me like no one else, and I could never imagine that the person I loved and bet my life on would throw me away like a piece of trash. Maybe the kids will find their way back to you eventually, but I never will. Jack, please don't say that. I'll do anything. I'll go to a psychologist. You can sleep with other women. Please don't leave me. I lived with a feeling of guilt. I wanted to stop, and I always came back to you. It was just a meaningless fling. Oh God, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. Linda, save your breath. I don't believe a word you say, and at this point, I just don't care about you or your lies. Now listen to me carefully. On Monday, the bank will hand you divorce papers. God, no, Jack. Please don't divorce me. Please, Linda, listen to me. 
Your boss's wife has already received copies of the video and photos of your dirty affair when you cheated on me with him in our bedroom. So, it seems likely that you and John Monroe will be stuck with each other when his wife and I both leave your unfaithful selves. Jack, please tell me you didn't do this. He has a wife and two children. Why are you going to destroy them? Wow, Linda, you just don't get it. It's not me who's wrecking their family. You and John Monroe ruined everything. Your cheap affair wrecked not only my life, your life, and the lives of our children, but also his wife and children. You can be proud of yourself. You contributed to the downfall of eight people. Fortunately for you, you're such a selfish person that you probably don't care. Her sobbing intensified, resonating over the phone, but I'm not finished yet. Your boss will face a civil lawsuit for alienation of affection, though we'll need to find out which hospital he's in. Apparently, he was unlucky. Wrong place. Wrong time. I heard from a friend that Monroe was attacked in an airport parking lot and ended up in the hospital with a crushed testicle and a damaged knee. So it's hard to say when he'll be fit enough to be intimate with anyone again. Stop it. Jack, stop being so cruel. I don't care about him, I just want you. Please don't do this to us. Listen, Linda, again, there is no zoo. It's uncertain whether you and your boss will still have your jobs by the end of next week because I also sent these photos to the president and board members of the U.S. Bank of Commerce, along with the alienation of affection and sexual harassment lawsuit. Negotiate. I will try to keep you on the job, but I will require them to fire him for cause. No, Jack. No. Do you really hate me that much? Linda, you demonstrated your hatred for me with your betrayal, lies, and disrespect. You took the love I cherished for you and ripped it from my soul. I'm just trying to regain some self-respect before our lives diverge. At this point, Linda was crying so hard and emitting cries of disbelief and denial that I wasn't sure she could listen to me any longer. I suppressed my anger and felt pain and regret for what I was putting her through, because I knew I still loved her, even though I despised her. It was a very unsettling mix of emotions that tore at my soul, but overall, I was determined to take revenge and deeply wound her for what she had done to me. Linda, we're almost done. Try to concentrate on the next few points. I took the $125,000 we had in savings and used $25,000 to pay for Krista's next two years of college. I will assist her in the future, but for now, this is all I can afford. I'm leaving the house to you. I signed the contract in your name, and the capital will be about $100,000 if you sell it now. I'm not selling our house, Jack, and I want you to stop this madness and come back to me so we can heal. Please, for our 23 years of love and happiness before I go crazy. I ignored this comment and continued. Linda, if you sign the divorce papers, you will keep the house and all its contents. I'll keep the $100,000 that's left from our savings and we'll call it a day. If you don't agree to the divorce or start fighting it, I don't care. I won't be there to argue. Do what you want. I don't care. We're almost done. Linda, there are a few more things I need to share with you. If you look around, you'll notice that I've moved out. I took what I wanted, and the rest is yours. I took some photos and left the wedding photo albums with you. Save them, burn them. I don't care. I left my wedding ring on the dresser. You can melt it or flush it down the toilet, just like our marriage. Ryan is coming to pick up some of my fishing and hunting gear that he needs. He will come when you are not there. So don't be alarmed if you notice that someone has been in the house. He doesn't want to see you. Krista is coming to pick up all her things. She has no plans to ever live there again. She'll also prefer to come by when you're away. So don't be surprised if you see her room empty. The last thing you should know is that I also sent pictures of you cheating on me to your parents. My parents and all of our contacts in both of our email databases. So you might want to prepare for that. What story will you tell them all? I'll be damned if I'm going to be the bad guy in this failed marriage. Her crying and screaming had now escalated to such a level that I was afraid she might pass out or get hurt. This had to end. Linda, Linda, one more thing. I quit my job last week and am moving out of state into the unknown can find someone in the future who loves me enough to stay true to the promises we make to each other. Someone who will respect me, treat me as an equal, and someone I can trust and love again. I hope that you, in turn, will be able to find what you clearly lacked. Please don't look for me. If you need me for anything, you can send a message through Ryan or through my lawyer.
but I will be out of your life and you out of mine. Goodbye, Linda. I heard her scream, Jack. No, no, please, Jack, please forgive me. I broke down and burst into an agonizing bout of crying and pain. I think I knew I had gone too far with my revenge, and it would take me a long time to forgive myself for my cruelty. I doubted that I would ever forgive her. I knew the road ahead of me would be painful before I could heal myself and feel ready for something more than living alone. More than anything, I didn't want to lead a life full of bitterness. But remembering the morning on top of the mountain, I reminded myself that there will still be moments of beauty and magic in my life. I just need to stay open to them and keep moving towards a new beginning. Subscribe to our channel so that your second half doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story. Because this story is nothing compared to the next one.